Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grace Bible Fellowship. It's good to see you all. I can see you're all very happy to get out of the house. What a wonderful thing it is that God's created the body of Christ and how we have fellowship with him and fellowship with one another. It's, uh, boy, something that we really do miss when we don't have it, isn't it? It's wonderful. We are back in the book of Romans again today. We're in chapter 10, going to finish it from 14 to 21. And the verse that I picked out for today out of that section is chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. How many of you believe that? Amen. Amen. There was a time in which I heard the word of God and it convinced my heart and the Lord opened my eyes to understand who Jesus was. And I became a new creature, a new creature in Christ Jesus. The old things are gone and the new things have come. I'm so glad for that. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you because in and of ourselves, Lord, we know we have nothing to offer you. And yet you call us to worship you in spirit and truth. You call us to give our all and put it before you, as it were, on an altar. And so here this morning, we want to do that. We want to leave it all in the field. We want to give you our heart and our soul and our mind and our strength. And Lord, we need your help to do that. You know that we are frail, that we are still struggling with perfection, which we'll never attain on this side. But Lord, you call us onward and upward. I pray that you might help us today, that you might dust us off and polish us up and make us more like you, that you would speak to each one of our hearts in the place where you know we have a need. We know your word is so good at that. I pray that you help us to be listening and that you would help me to speak your words in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Two of the most difficult things, I think, for people are abandonment, and rejection. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You know, when you're going to school, it was the cool kids' table that you couldn't sit at. You know, it was uh, you were last picked for kickball, or whatever it was for you. Or you know, you you sat in the back, in the corner. Whatever it was, that sort of rejection and abandonment is something that we really identify with, and uh, we tend to be very sensitive to. So as we're looking through the book of Romans, Paul is laying out this wonderful treatise of God's love for us and how all things work together for good, for those that love him, for the called according to his purpose. He shows us that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And as we go through, we get to see God's sovereignty, that God is truly in control. And in a world that's gone to hell in a handbasket, you know what I'm talking about? Praise God, he's still on the throne. And he has a plan to work all this together for good. For those who love the Lord. That's right, for the called according to his purpose. Are you called today? I hope so. Then you can can bank on that promise. But today we're going to do, we're going to talk about show and tell. Show and tell. If if Jesus has uh, saved you and made you a new creation, let me see it by a show of hands. I love that. I really do. And that's a wonderful thing. And because we have it, we have an obligation to share that. Because the rest of the world, all of your unsaved relatives and friends and the people that you work with and the place where you go shopping, there are people who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ who are not in relationship with them. And what a tremendous privilege it is. If any of you have had the privilege of leading people to Jesus Christ, you know what a great thing it is to introduce them to Christ and then watch them kind of take root, you know, get some rubber on the road and get going. And uh, what a wonderful thing that is. We had some men in here from Keswick yesterday, and uh, one of the men named Tony shared his testimony about how the Lord saved him and took him out of a, a world of, of craziness. And now he's serving up there at the Colony of Mercy. It was uh, very encouraging to see. And uh, the director came and David Harris came and sang for us. It was uh, it was very encouraging. And I think 
my goodness, you know, they're, they're there doing business with God and trying to do some serious reconstruction on the inside of the hearts of these folks, and we're out here. They can't necessarily go and share the gospel, but we can. And I just think it's a, a, it's a wonderful privilege. So as we open this up, just to remind you, we're in chapter 10, which is right in the middle. It's about Israel's present case when Paul is writing this in the first century. This is what we went over last week, taking it from verse 8. But, but what does it say, meaning the scripture? It says, the word is near you, it is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith in which we preach. If you remember previously, he said, it's not so unattainable that you have to go to heaven and get information straight from God because God sent his son, direct information. And it's not like you have to go down to the abyss and, and rise it up or on the far side of the sea because Jesus Christ was risen from the dead and came back and demonstrated his power. And so these things about understanding who God is and what he would have for us to do are not unknowable. They're not unfathomable. They're not unreachable. They're as close as your mouth and your heart. Verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Have you ever had to preach that to yourself? You start wondering, am I saved? Am I not saved? I'm going through a tough time. I'm having a hard time. I don't even know if I'm a Christian because everybody else seems to be really happy and I'm kind of miserable. Okay, maybe not you. But I feel that way sometimes. And I have to remind myself, if I, if I, if I believe, if I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus, that means he's the boss of my life, and I confess it with my mouth, but it's more than that. I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. I will be saved. It's that simple. It's not complicated. There's not 10 things that you need to do or 75 things to be a better you. Or you were accepted by God on the basis of faith, on believing what he said and accepting Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. It's the simplest thing. Even a child can do it. Verse 10, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness. And by the way, it's not a righteousness you possess. It's a righteousness that's been given to you. It's not something you manufacture in and of yourselves. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is over all, is rich to all who call upon him. Do you know that there's nobody so far away that God won't accept them? There's no sin that you have ever committed that is so far from God's grace that's bigger than his love for you? I don't know about you, but I, I have some dark things in my past. And sometimes the devil will get on my shoulder and remind me of what a foul, horrible, terrible person I am, or at least that I was in the past. But I still bear that today, and I have to fight it off by saying, you know, I'm accepted by, by Christ, and Jesus died for those sins. I'm free. You're free. So whatever it is that the devil likes to load onto your back and make you carry, cut the straps. And it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Greek, God is rich upon anyone who calls out. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever. That's a big sign that God would hold up to every human heart and say, whoever, that, that's everyone. There's no one excluded. You can't say, oh, well, I'm not related to Abraham, I'm not going to heaven. Or I don't go to church, so I'm not going to heaven. Or I don't, you know, whatever it is, fill in the blank. If you believe, if you confess the Lord Jesus, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's it. And then... If that's true, if all of that is true, you begin to change because the Holy Spirit of God is inside of you. It's not something where you have to, oh, I got to remember the 27 things I need to do today or God's going to see me as a failure and he's going to leave me. Why do we always have those thoughts? Because we're frustrated with ourselves, aren't we? And we get frustrated with other people. We have to deal with their mess. <laughs> and sometimes I want to leave them. And so I figure, you know, I have to imprint my heart on God and say, well, God's like that with me, right? No, not at all. Not even a little bit. But it's funny how the human mind works. 
Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Beginning the new section, verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how should they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Well, yes, indeed. Their sound has gone out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I say, did Israel not know? Well, first Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. But Isaiah is very bold and says, I have found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. But to Israel, he says, all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. So we're going to talk about rejection and reconciliation, how we can be reconciled to God and why it is that there are people who are rejected before God. And it's not on the basis of being good enough or not. It's on the basis of us obeying the whosoevers. It's interesting, up till this point in the previous chapter, Paul has centered in on God's sovereignty. Jacob I loved and Esau I hated, and so that it might stand by election, that it's God's election and not man's work. You know, that's why he did it that way. And so we see a very strong stance on election and God's sovereignty. You'll notice in this chapter, a large chunk of it is about our human responsibility to respond to God's call. Not really talking about God's sovereignty, but talking about man's responsibility to respond. So let's pick it up from verse one. How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Well, that makes sense, right? How are you gonna call, how are you gonna call somebody you don't believe in, right? I, I, if I don't have your number, I can't call you, right? And if you, don't, if you don't know about who the Lord Jesus Christ is, certainly you can't put your faith in him, right? So how are you going to call on him if you don't know him? Do you know that there are people in this world that know the name of Jesus? They might know the historical Jesus, but they don't know the Lord Jesus. Do they see it in you? They should. We should, I don't know about you, but I feel like I should be shining all the time like a, like a brand new penny. Because I'm clean. I mean, that's, that's what Jesus declared. I'm clean. And I've been set free from all kinds of stuff, and I know you have as well. I think we get our eyes on this world too much, and suddenly we don't shine. But we can. And then we can point people to him and have them call on him. It says here in Romans 10, verses 9 to 13, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to same. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is over all, rich to all who call upon him. And whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Notice he's taking the same theme that we previously discussed in chapter 10, and he's carrying it through. He's talking about being called. How, how are you going to call on somebody? How are you going to believe in them if you don't believe that they exist? Are you telling people about Jesus? You see, this is about our personal responsibility to share the good news of what we know. So God's sovereignty put aside, he's saying, listen, we have an obligation. If, if you've got good news, I mean, I don't know about you, it's hard for me to buy a gift from my wife even at Christmas and keep it a secret. That's just the way I am. I, I, I buy this really cool thing, and I'm like, she's going to love this. And I'm like, hey, I got your Christmas gift. Do you want it early? <laughs> and she's like, no, no, that's not how it works. She's a big rule keeper. <laughs> what, 
Well, it's Christmas Eve. What about Christmas Eve? What do we... No, no, just wait, just wait, just wait. What do you mean wait? You're going you're gonna to like this. And yet to share Jesus Christ, why don't I feel that same, that, that, that zeal to share the good news of Jesus Christ? I think sometimes our, our life lacks reflection and joy because we don't remember and we don't hold on to it, you know, and things tend to fall loose if we don't do that. But he's, how shall we, how are they, unbelievers, and he's speaking specifically of the Jews right now, how are they, how shall they call on him of whom they have not believed? So it's our obligation to share those things. In Hebrews eleven six, it says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. You know, there are a lot of people thinking they're doing a good thing by being good people and they grit their teeth and they just kind of deal with it because they figure they're doing, you know, I'm getting God to love me. Wouldn't it be a great bit of news that all of that's worthless? Wouldn't it be a great bit of news to tell them that all you have to do is believe what God said? That's it. Because without that, you can't please God. Right? Without faith, it is impossible to please him. And he who comes to God must believe, A, that he is, that he exists, and B, that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Did you know that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him? I wonder, how diligent are we? Sometimes I rest on this side of human responsibility, and I remember God is sovereign, and God's going to do whatever the heck he wants to do, like an 800-pound gorilla in the, in the jungle, sleeps anywhere he wants. And so I don't pray diligently, because I figure, you know, God's got this rigged, he knows what he's doing, and I don't have to activate, and yet the scripture is very clear. We should seek him diligently. He asks us to, he wants us to. It's almost like he knows when we're going to be diligent and he already has the answer to the prayer and he's ready to give it out, but we have to pray. Praying is not changing God's mind. Praying is getting on board with what God wants to do and asking him to do the thing that he's wanting to do and suddenly you're in on it. That's really what prayer is. But we have an obligation to be diligent and seek him. Verse 14, how shall they call on him whom they've not believed? How shall they believe in him on whom they've not heard. Certainly people can't believe in Jesus Christ if they've never heard of him. And how shall they hear without a preacher? I know what you're thinking. That's me. <laughs> I got news for you. That's you. Do you know what the leaders, you know what the leaders in the church are supposed to do? They're not the ones who do the ministry. They're to prepare God's people for works of ministry. That's what it says in Ephesians. So do people know you as a preacher? Because how are they going to know unless you tell them? Because you're going to meet people I'll never meet. You're going to meet people who like you and they don't like me at all. You got a foot in the door. I'm just going to offend them because I'm super sarcastic. <laughs> how are they going to call on him if they've not believed? I don't know about you, but sometimes I don't want to step out and share with somebody about Jesus Christ because I'm afraid I'm going to get rejected. I'm afraid they're going to look at me funny. They're going to be mean to me and say nasty things. Boy, if I shrink from, if I shrink from sharing the good news of eternity that they can have a relationship with their Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ because I don't want my feelings hurt, why doesn't that way out? And I think about the God who created everything has left the evangelization of this world to you and I. I don't know. I don't, I don't think I, I don't feel qualified for that. You feel qualified for that? Hey, let me tell you about Jesus. Okay, well, let me just hang out with you for a few weeks and see if you live a perfect life. All right, never mind. I won't say a word. I'm going to shut up because I know I'm not perfect. And once I'm perfect, then I can share the gospel. Then I got something. Then I got something to show you. You know, then I'm a shiny penny. No, that's not the deal. 
But that's the way we think sometimes, isn't it? Just pointing things out to people like the night sky. I don't know about you, but last night, the night sky was just beautiful. You could see all the stars. The moon was out. It was just a crisp, cold night, which I don't care for that part, but you could see everything. I know why old people move to Florida. It, it's not just a place where people go to die. It's a place where people go to be warm. So I get it. I understand that. But the sky was so clear and so beautiful last night. I was just absolutely awestruck by that. And people that are just, they're like a bunch of little rats running in their holes and they got their activity going on down here and they're watching, you know, social media and, you know, they're watching the world. And they're, look up. All of the things that we get all twisted up about down here are so small in comparison. And God set all of that stuff up and he's got us in a perfect orbit. I mean, I, I have... I have a hard time balancing five things at the grocery store when I don't take a cart. You know, God's got the whole solar system, everything rotating and going around with various moons, and nothing hits each other. And it's been that way for a long time. And the candle that is our sun is constantly getting smaller, and he knows when it'll go out. You can point just little things like that out to people and... There's a God in heaven who loves you and cares for you, and he sent his son to die for you so that you can have a relationship with him. It's the simplest message, and you don't have to be perfect because you, you'll never be, and the devil will shoot you down with that. You just need to have a living, breathing, spiritual life. And he's the one that gives us the strength to do that. Amen? Amen. And so God speaks to us, but how are they going to hear about Jesus without somebody telling them? By the way, this word preacher is keruso. Everybody say keruso. keruso. You all speak in Greek. Isn't that great? You just learned a Greek word today. Keruso. It means a herald, like a public crier, you know, like in the colonial times. Hear ye, hear ye. They ring the bell and they tell the news before they had newspapers and, you know, printing press and all that kind of stuff. That's what a preacher is. It's, a, it's somebody who... Preaches, tells the good news, and, it, and it's usually done with enthusiasm, right? Especially divine truth, like the gospel. So that's the actual word, Caruso. But see, I always confuse it with this guy. That's Enrico Caruso in 1917, who was a famous singer. You know, maybe you... I won't, I won't go into singing operatic, but I always get him confused with this other guy, who's Pavarotti, but... So when I think of preacher, I think of Caruso, because that's the word, and I think of Pavarotti, you know, that, that, you know, that big giant voice that punches you in the face? That's, the scripture says, how are they going to believe unless they hear about Jesus, and how are they going to hear unless there's a preacher, unless somebody is going to declare clearly that which God has already spoken and you and I understand? You're the preacher. You're the preacher. Everybody say, I'm a preacher. I'm, a preacher. I'm glad none of you said, you're the preacher. I'm glad. <laughs> and how shall they preach unless they're sent? It just makes too much sense, right? So how are people going to call on the one they don't believe? And how are they going to believe unless they hear? And how are they going to hear without a preacher? And how is somebody going to preach to them until, unless they're sent? Like, we're all going to leave this room at some point today. You're all going to be sent. You're not just going. You're being sent. It's like this. Send a preacher so I can hear, believe, and call on Jesus. That's essentially what it is. It's all broken down. That's the Jersey version of the Bible right there. Send me a preacher so I can hear, believe, and call on Jesus. You know, I don't know why it took me so long to understand who Christ is. I know God's sovereignty and all that. But there was one man who opened his mouth and shared about Jesus with me on a regular basis, and he diligently sought the Lord for my soul. And now I know the Lord Jesus Christ. And I will always be indebted. I will always remember this person. His name is Brian Yannick, who led me to Jesus Christ, and my life changed. You could be that person. You could be that girl. 
You could be that guy. And you don't have to be obnoxious about it. And you don't have to, you know, have Jesus stickers all over your car and all over your body and, you know, you know, giant cross this big. You know, you don't have to be ostentatious or uh, abusive and annoying. Just because you love them. Because the people that you meet, you actually love. And you say, wow, I don't want to, I don't want to go through eternity and not spend time with you. It says in Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, you might be familiar with this as the Great Commission. And Jesus spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That's an important first phrase because he's about to ask them to do something. But he's telling them that he's in charge. Therefore, it says go, therefore, or as you're going, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to do all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Jesus says he's in charge, he owns everything, He's at a place of authority, and he gives us authority. He confers authority to us to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Isn't that something? Take it apart. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Did you know Jesus has all authority on earth? You might miss that watching CNN. <laughs> Jesus has all authority on heaven and earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples. By the way, he didn't say make converts. He didn't say make followers of you. He said make followers of me. Disciples, disciplined followers of Jesus Christ. Of all nations, which means no one's excluded. There's nobody so low, there's nobody so high that you can't talk to. If I run into Bruce Springsteen, I'm going to have a conversation with him in love because I think God loves him as an individual apart from anything he's ever done. If I run into Ozzy Osbourne, you get what I'm saying. There's nobody that's too far that God can't save them and that I shouldn't share with them. And I shouldn't be so, uh, 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 oh, it, it, oh, uh. why do we do that? Have you ever done that? Meet somebody that, that you, you, you highly respect or esteem or you know that they're, they're famous or whatever, and they go, hey, how you doing? And you're like, I'm okay. <laughs> Why do people do that? Because all authority has been given to Jesus Christ, and he's given it to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's why we baptize people. See that wet guy over there? I chose that picture because he's not here today. So we'll talk about him. No, I'm just, that's Michael Tunney when he went under. Baptizing them, which means you identify with the death, the, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and you identify with Christ. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. By the way, that's part of what making disciples is. It's teaching them everything, teaching you guys everything that Jesus has said, everything the scripture contains. That's what we're doing here today right? I hope you're learning because I'm, I'm teaching my head out. So, <laughs> and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so as you go and as you tell the show and tell that's happening, know that I'm with you. I haven't left you. It's not like, you know, Jesus said, peace out. I'm, I'm going to heaven and I'll catch up with you later. I will be with you always. He's here. He's now. Where two or more gather in my name, there I am in the midst of them, Jesus says. So when God feels far away, guess who left? <laughs> it wasn't him. And lo, I will be with you always, even unto the end of the age. And so it's important if we expect people to come to Jesus Christ and if we really care about him, we're going to go out and we're going to preach the gospel, the good news. The good news is you're rotten to the core. There's not a darn thing you can do about it. That's the bad news of the good news. The good news is God has made a way for you. God has made a way for you through his own son. 
So, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. How many of you are confused with feet being in the Bible? Oh, you're all good with that. Okay. How beautiful are the feet? That whole thing troubles me because I can't think of a more unattractive part of a human body than the feet. And especially feet that are in open toe sandals that are walking on dirt roads where animals just drop and defecate wherever they feel like it. You see, this is referring back to the Old Testament when the Assyrians were actually uh, under God's judgment and Israel was then released. And somebody had run across with this message and I'm sure they looked sweaty and they were battered and their feet were probably bruised and cut and they were, you know, just miserable, but they brought good news. And it's to the point where it's like, what beautiful feet you have that you would come and run and tell this news that you would suffer tripping on rocks and, you know, avoiding rattlesnakes and, you know, all the other stuff that you have to do back then. It's not like jumping in a car and turning a key. You, you had to go for miles. I mean, before the Pony Express. How awesome is it that somebody would go through those lengths to share the gospel of peace with somebody? Aren't you glad somebody shared the gospel with you? And probably over and over and over and over until you finally gave way and said, all right, all right, I quit. You're right. I'm a sinner. So when I think of beautiful feet, I, you know, people's feet, there's some people with some funny feet, man. <laughs> you get, some people have like a really big toe and then everything else is small. Or some people's second toe is longer than all their other toes. There are people with, with toes that go down nice and sloped, and then they have a little teeny, teeny, teeny little fifth toe. Does it, it's not even big enough to grow a nail on it. You can't even put nail polish on that thing. It's just too small. So, you know, like some people have a feet fetish. I think I'm the other way. It's It's... It's just the way that it is. And then, you know, as you get older, it doesn't get any better. And girls, you have to wear high heel shoes and things that are constricting and, and all of that other stuff. And that's just, that's just tough. It's just really tough. And people's feet, you know, even children's feet, you know, I don't know if you've ever had to scrub children's feet, but they have cute little feet. But, you know, where, where were you that, that this happened? And people that would otherwise look beautiful standing in a pose, if you take the, the toe shoe off of the ballerina, it, it's, it's a hideous mass of bones and flesh that has been crumpled into a, a cylinder so that for your enjoyment to watch them dance. And so the most beautiful feet that you would think would be popping out of a, a beautiful ballerina, they're, they're the most beastly chunks of meat that you'd ever want to see. Oh, trust me, I, I've been online. And some hideous things going on. But, you know, and there are people that look like they're hobbits. Those are real feet. Those are not like slippers you slip into and it makes you look or, or something out of the, you know, out of the hobbit. This is like somebody's real feet. So how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news? There are people who are weird. And God picks them, and he pours out his Holy Spirit into them, and this beautiful fragrance comes from them. And I think he pours himself more out on the ugly figures than he does the attractive figures. And those people are doing the work and sharing the gospel, and, and boy, how beautiful is somebody who is fully committed to the Lord Jesus Christ and out of the love of their heart sharing Christ with other people. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Uh, not arrogantly telling people, you know, you're going to hell, you know, none of that. But because I love you and I care about you, I want to share this good news with you. Even their feet are beautiful. So I get it. I'm getting over my phobia. Verse 16, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. And he's speaking of Israel. 
Israel did not listen to the gospel when it was preached to them. And if you remember, Paul went, and everywhere he went, he went into a synagogue, a synagogue, a synagogue, a synagogue, until he got kicked out. And he goes, I'm done. He says, I'm kicking the dust off my feet. I'm going to the Gentiles because you guys aren't listening. He finally got it. Aha. It's for everybody, for the Jew as well as the Gentile. But he started with the Jews until he got completely rejected. They have not all obeyed the gospel for Isaiah says, and this is all the way back in Isaiah, Lord, who has believed our report? In other words, there's nobody listening. We keep telling, we keep heralding and saying, hey, this is the news and nobody's listening. Who's listening? There's nobody here. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. I, this is from Isaiah 53 previously. He says, who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he, this is speaking of Christ, shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. Jesus is referred to as the shoot that comes out of the root of Jesse. For he has no form or comeliness. In other words, he wasn't an attractive man. You wouldn't go, that dude should be a model. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. You know, Jesus was not this, you know, skipping down the road, throwing flowers around. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. This is Isaiah saying, we, we as a people, we, the Jewish people, we didn't, we didn't recognize him. We didn't see, he came to his own, but his own did not receive him. But to those who did, he gave the right to become the children of God, it says in the book of John. He was rejected. And we have to be careful because we live in a world that has already rejected Jesus Christ, feels they have no need for Jesus Christ because they got it under control. You know what that's like? I, I, got, I got this. I got this under control. Until they don't, and you're the first person they call to pray for you, right? Pray for them. I want you to pray for me. Oh, really? I thought you had it all rigged. Of course, you never say that, but you think it. And then you pray for them. This word, hearing the word of God, that word, word, is actually rhema. Rhema, thank you. It's actually said with a ch, rhema, like that. Rhema, that which has been uttered by a living voice. That which has been uttered by a living voice. It's not a, a, the printed word. The printed word is one thing. Jesus Christ being the word, as you see in the book of John, is another. This is the spoken word. If you remember all the way back in Genesis, it says, the Lord spoke and it was so. Isn't that curious? I thought we only had vocal cords. God has vocal cords? He's not, a, he's not in a physical body. How does he have vocal cords? How did God speak everything into existence? He said, let there be light. And there was light. He separated light from the darkness. He said, let land appear. And it happened. He said, let vegetation appear, which it did. Let there be animals. Let there be birds in the sky and fish in the sea and animals on the land. Let it be. He just spoke them into existence. This is the rhema, which is being referred to. The ability to speak life. I think about Paul when he got saved. If you remember, he was Saul of Tarsus and he was on the road. He was going to persecute some Christians and the Lord just showed up and spoke. Spoke to him. That's the rhema. God ever speak to your heart? I mean, not an audible voice necessarily, but he spoke to your heart and, you, and he went, bingo. And he puts his finger on something in your heart. I've had that happen and I just burst into tears. I'd, I've been watching The Chosen on, on the TV and a couple of those scenes just make me weep, but because the Spirit of God moves in my heart and God's Word, God's rhema, his spoken word right to my heart comes. In Hebrews 4, verses 1 and 2 says, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, 
let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. This is coming into Christ. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. See, the missing ingredient, the only difference between you and someone else who's not going to spend eternity with God is faith. That's it. You believed what God said. You know, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. That's the only difference. It seems like there's got to got to be something more to me, God, that, than just faith. I mean, what about all the good things I do? What about the people I help? What about, you know, the, the, the late nights and the early mornings? And Nope. It doesn't add a thing. When I think about that, I say, well, <laughs> I could just try a whole lot less then. But you see, we're not working to get God's love. We're working like like a racehorse. You ever, you ever see a racehorse run? I just find it fascinating. You see every muscle working, laboring, and it's, and you know, a little guy in the back holding on for all he's worth. I, I don't bet on the, the horses, but I've seen them run, and it's fabulous. They don't run because they have to, and they, you know, they're going to make me into soap if I don't. They love it. They're designed to do that. They love to run. We, I have dogs at home we got to put on a leash because you know what? They love to run. And if you let them go, they'll just keep going and you'll never see them again. You wave, bye. <laughs> Not because they're treated so badly because they're fed and they're groomed and they're loved and, you know, they love being at home, but they have something where they just want to run. It's in their nature. And guess what? When you've been given a new nature, you desire to do those things that please the Father. It's just an inborn thing. Not that you don't feel like laying down sometimes, but it's in there. And so we mix it with faith. The only difference between us and the people who aren't saved is believing in Jesus Christ as a Savior. And it's the simplest message that any of us can share with somebody. It doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for a week or for many, many years. Boil it down, make it simple, because the people around you want to know. They just don't know it yet. But I say, have they not heard, speaking of the Jews? Yes, indeed. Their sound has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. I was telling you about how nice it was the other night to look up and see all the stars. And the scripture says in Psalm 19, verses 1 to 4, a psalm of David, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork, firmaments the sky. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. Did you know God can speak through a starry sky? That's why he put it there. So you could go, wow, I'm really small. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. There's no need to understand someone else's language to have a conversation if they look at the stars. Their line uh, or, or their, their word has gone out through all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Do you see, God's creation speaks of his character and of his bigness. And we would do well to just take a deep breath and remember that periodically or go to the mountains we don't have any of these around here. What we call mountains are really just kind of hills, you know. But you go to a place where there's some real mountains. How many of you have seen mountains? You've been around? Yeah, well, someday I'll get out there. But what a fantastic thing to go out and see just the grandeur, just to go through the, uh, the, the water gap in Pennsylvania is just fascinating to me. I'm driving and I'm looking, trying not to crash. It's a lot of weight. That's a lot of rock. There's a lot going on there. There's a lot to see. I really should get out of the car one time and take a walk, but um, I, just, I just go slower than everybody else and try to take it in. But does, the, something in our heart begins to change, and we start to see ourselves in comparison when we look at the things that God has created, and they just sit there as a testimony to everybody. And it doesn't matter what language it is, you can see God. Or you go to the ocean. 
Uh, not, not the bay. So those are real little waves, but where they have really big waves. Um, I, I saw a man last night ride on the biggest wave that has ever been recorded. It was a 60-foot wave, and the guy actually rode a surfboard on it. That's crazy. <laughs> Got to have a death wish or a high degree of agility, <laughs> which I don't. So I was just amazed. But to look at how all of that works together, when you can see the moon on a clear night and you notice that it's changing phase and all the things that God has created, it speaks of him. And it's a constant signal to everybody, hey, I'm here. I care. Want to talk? <laughs> that's, what it, that's what it speaks to my heart. And it doesn't matter where you're from or what language you speak, God will speak to you through those things. It says here in 2 Peter 3, verses 2 to 5, you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and by the commandment to, of us, the apostles of our Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days. Do I hear an amen? amen. There's a lot of scoffers around. They walk according to their own lusts, and they say, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. First of all, who says that? Those who have fathers who fell asleep. He's talking about the Jewish people. That there are Jewish people that say, hey, where's the promise of his coming? Come on. I mean, since, since all the prophets and, and Moses and all those guys are dead, everything in creation has been the same ever since the beginning. Really? That means that you would have had to have been there and observe it. That's like, you're the worst person in the whole world. How do you know that? Do you know everyone? You can't say that. But here... They say all things have been the same and they continue as they were from the beginning of creation. You, that's, that's a giant assumption, which is wrong. In verse 5, for they willfully forget. Did you know that remembering and forgetting is completely under your control? Oh, pastor, you don't know. I forget things all the time. Do you write them down? Uh, well, no. Okay. You write yourself notes? Uh, no. No. Have you discovered the little note app on your phone? Oh, yeah, 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 I, I know it's there. You can remind yourself. You know, you can also willfully forget. That's what forgiveness is. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness is willful forgetfulness. And if somebody says, hey, you remember that thing that I did to you yesterday that I apologized to you for? You could say, no, I definitely remember forgetting that. You can be willfully forgetful. You know, we tend to push things into the corners of our minds or, you know, put our fingers in our ears and go, la, 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 la. We do all sorts of weird things to try to forget about things. It, by the way, it's not psychologically, emotionally, physically, spiritually healthy. You deal with it and you bring it to the Lord and then the Lord fixes it. He puts it in the right place. They willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water. You see, they forget that God was there in the beginning and he was the one that did all this and he's also the one that said he's coming back. Just as true as all these creations were made by him and put into place, it's just as true he's coming back. And it's, I believe it's much sooner now than it's ever been. But I say... Did Israel not know? Because what, what do you do with Israel that had the, the prophets and had the law and they had the, the sacrificial system and the priesthood and the temple? And didn't they know? First, Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation and I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. Moses, speaking to the people on behalf of God, says, I'm going to make you guys jealous and I'm going to make you angry because they're going to be other people that I bless and it's going to make you jealous of what they have because you've rejected me. Isn't that something? And God says, I'm going to stir you up to anger. God would stir someone up to anger if it means your salvation, he would. 
Aren't you glad he loves us that much? There's nothing like being ignored. And you know, I'm sure that the bird that that bird is standing on is not happy. In case you didn't get the picture. I'm going to make you jealous of another people that get blessed by me. And I'm going to anger you with a foolish nation. But Isaiah is very bold when he says, I, have found by, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. Do you realize that God came to you and knocked on your heart's door? We should be so thankful because he didn't have to do that. I wonder if we are that nation that God has called to create jealousy in the hearts of the Jewish nation, when people see you, when unsaved people see you, are they jealous? Does it make them angry? I remember working in a steel plant and I had guys come up to me and say, man, you used to be a psycho and now you, you don't even get mad anymore. And they used to abuse me and do all kinds of things. And I just let it roll off. I had special grace at that point. The Lord took some of that grace back. I had to deal with myself. But do people look and are they jealous of you? Do they look at your life? Not because you, you have more stuff than them or you're younger than them or more handsome than them or but because you have a relationship with God and it just emanates from you? Because that's God's plan. God's plan is that you are the light of the world and you're a city that's on a hill and you can't be hidden. That you're the salt of the earth. You're the thing that preserves the, the world. You're the thing that uh, gives flavor. That's who we are as a people. And do we cause other people to be jealous? Like, man, I, what is it that you have that you can... Be patient, because, man, you're patient. And, boy, you seem to be so loving, and you, you're you so giving. You, you, I mean, you reach into your pocket, and, I mean, you just got paid, and a bunch of your money just went out to, to help somebody else. And, like, why do, you, why do you do that? You know, what's what's going on with you? And you really, really love your wife. What's the secret? Do you make people jealous? Do you make them curious by your behavior? Because that's what God said he's going to do. He's going to make people angry and jealous of what you have. So how are they going to be that way if, if you're not going to shine? I don't know about you. I got some things to rise to. This is what people think about Christianity. This is a, uh, this is a, a family sticker on the back of a van in Utah, which is where the Mormons are. So I'll help you. This is daddy, and this is mommy number one, mommy number two, mommy number three, and, and all of the various children. You know, you got to wonder what people think, because they think that Mormons are Christians. They think Jehovah Witnesses are Christians. They think all of the Catholics are Christians. They think, they think of everybody in a big, giant box. If you're not a Muslim or a Hindu or a Buddhist, you're a Christian. So what are they thinking? What are they thinking? I don't know. Uh, I don't know if you know Toy Story, but this is Buzz Lightyear. And Buzz Lightyear strikes me as one of those really annoying, positive Christians that's always telling people about Jesus, you know. And he's not afraid of anything. And, you know, he, I can fly. And everybody says, you can't fly. And he falls gracefully, which is the same thing. So I just think so often I can come off as annoying. And when I'm sharing the gospel or talking about Jesus, I can be a very annoying person. I have, I have cornered people who didn't want to hear a thing I had to say. I would corner them. And I'd force them to take a track. I'd put stuff it in their pocket. I, you know, I, would, I was a very forceful, evangelical, newly saved, empty-headed, zealous Christian. And I had no idea what I was doing to people. I can tell you my ministry back then had much less fruit. But I think of annoying people like Buzz Lightyear can be. And I don't want to be that guy. I used to be like Buzz. Anyway. But to Israel, he says, all day long I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. 
Isaiah says that God says, I'm reaching out constantly to a people that don't care and they don't listen. So that's what happened with Israel. They just turned their back and said, I'm, I'm not going to do it like a, a rebellious child might. And Jesus is reaching down and he's reaching out and he says, with my outstretched arms, I'm beseeching these people to come. And there are all sorts of reactions that come when you do that. But it's God who so lovingly, and, and by the way, he's the best evangelist that there is. And the Holy Spirit is the most tender of gentlemen. And yet we're called to go into that arena and share what it is that we know. And because that's where, that's where miracles happen, by the way. For somebody to become a new creation in Christ Jesus is a miracle. Going back to Romans chapter 1, it says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. You know, when unrighteousness is allowed to go on and injustice is allowed to happen, you suppress righteousness. Because what might be known of God is manifest in them. God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they knew God? Everybody at some point had a connection. They did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. That is the progression of every human being on the face of the planet that doesn't accept Jesus Christ as Savior. The Lord is reaching out and speaking to them from a young age on the way up, and then eventually they make a turn. I don't believe this. I'm going this way. And you know, if the scripture says that's every person's experience, then I can bank on it that it's every person's experience. Which means I can share that with them and say, listen, there was a time when God was speaking to you and drawing you, huh? And they'll be like, you've been talking to my mother? <laughs> it's funny, I say things like that sometimes and people are like, you've been spying on me at home or something? There are people that come up after me after the service and say, did you, did you talk to my wife? No, I just read the scriptures. It says right here, they knew God, and yet they went their own way. And that's what happened with the Jewish people because there is a degree of free will that we are to exercise. And God has left all these commandments for us, and the greatest of which I think is the, the Great Commission, which is all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go into all the nations. How are they going to know unless there's a preacher that tells them? You're the preacher. Father, I pray that you might help us today to be your messengers, to be the ones who proclaim your rhema, that we would speak to this lost and dying world, not of the trivial things of this earth, but of the eternal things of your kingdom. Give us the strength, the joy, and the hope that we might fulfill your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.